Luke 22, verse 39 through 42. This is the text. Jesus went out to the Mount of Olives, as he often did, and his disciples went with him. When they got there, he told them, pray that you won't be tested. Jesus walked along a little further before he knelt down and prayed. Father, if you will, please don't make me suffer by drinking from this cup, but do what you want and not what I want. Very quickly, as I hurry up and take my time this morning, I dare you to pray for strength like Jesus. I dare you to pray for strength like Jesus. Prayer is one of these things that Jesus often gave himself to. Jesus continued to warn his followers about the change that was going to come. Jesus led his followers out of Jerusalem to a garden where he prayed. This word prayer from the original language means to speak to God or to request of God. The idea of prayer to God is actually worship toward God. Prayer is a form of worshiping God because God is the creator. He's the sustainer of life and we are the created. Anything that is created always honors the creator. We need to talk to him, God, as creator. We get this idea from Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7 where it says, God breathed into man the breath of life. This, this word, breath of life, come from an original Hebrew word, neshema. Neshema means God imparting life and wisdom. Basically, what does that mean? God gives us the activity of our limbs. God gives us the capacity to think or to become rational. God wakes us up. He helps us move day in and day out. God is worthy, ladies and gentlemen, of the exchange of ideas that we have. That's prayer. God, simply put, deserves our worship. The respect to tell God about our worries and our triumphs. God deserves all that we can give him. In this block of text, we see the immensity of God and the limitation of humanity. If our Lord Jesus, watch it now, has enough gumption to pray to God, being God himself, I can safely conclude today that we have access to God through prayer. Therefore, I dare you today to pray like Jesus Amen. for strength. Yeah. Point number one, watch it now. I dare you to pray when trouble is near. I dare you to pray when trouble is near. Let's look at verse 39 again. Jesus went out to the Mount of Olives as he often did and his disciples went with him. When they got there, he told them, pray that you won't be tested. Jesus at this time was in utter agony of the prospect that was going to come on the next day. Jesus wasn't necessarily concerned with the physical pain that he was going to go through, but the fact that the Son of God would bear the curse of sin. Our, our bodies eventually give over to years of toil here on this earth. We will grow old and feeble, but as we grow old and feeble in body, our soul actually gets stronger. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 1 helps us to understand that though this earthly house be dissolved, guess what I have? I have a building of God in heaven not made with hands. The idea is the closer you and I get to the grave, the closer you and I get to God spiritually. Sin wrecks the body from abuse, but more importantly, watch it, sin weighs heavy on the soul. Causes us to be in agony just as Jesus was. This is why he prays for strength. He prays for strength because his soul 
is heavy. Heavy in the fact, watch it, that sin separates us from God. And if Jesus is going to bear the sin in his body, that means at that time, sin separated him from God. Isaiah 59 verse 2, watch it. Sin creates a barrier between us and God. The ultimate idea is this of hell. That hell is separation from God. Hell in scripture is defined by several scenarios. How God needs out punishment for you and I is ultimately his concern and not ours. But separation from him is the idea of hell. Watch what 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 9 says. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out of the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. Imagine comrades of the Christian faith being cut off from God. This is the concern of Jesus. This essentially is what Jesus is going to deal with, being torn apart. Jesus actually being separated from himself. Remember, Jesus is God. He's separated from all he knows, literally what he is. Personally, as I think about this, as, as a mother who birthed me, as my mother who birthed me 39 years ago, would cut me off if she did. The mother that I think like, the mother who gave me this Brooklyn, New York accent, the mother that taught me in everything that I know, in all aspects, if my mother, the mother that I know, the mother that I think like and act like and talk like, if she was to cut me off, that would tear me to pieces. Yeah. So imagine, ladies and gentlemen, the creator of the world, the Lord of life, knowing his purpose was to come to earth to die. All of this comes at a cost. And one cost is being separated from his godness. And that's scary for him to be cut off from God the Father. Watch it. I dare you to look at your life and all the appetites we have for morality and to boldly talk to God in truth about them, to remove those sinful things, those sinful areas of existence from our life. Amazingly enough, watch it. In the middle of calamity, Christ never loses control. But watch what he says. Your will be done. That's a statement of truth, ladies and gentlemen, not to allow your current circumstance to doubt the power of God toward us. Negative circumstances have an amazing way of getting to the best of us. Jesus and his humanity in that limited state of humanity faces a major challenge. He did not waver. But he manned up <laughs> to his responsibility and watch what he does. He simply prays. Yeah. So I dare you to pray for strength like Jesus. Even in the middle of a pandemic, things are very unsettling. Loss of jobs, homes, food, family, and friends is very unsettling. You know, when we look at the news and try to disseminate what's going on, we hear a lot. We don't know what's real news. We don't know what's fake news. All we're getting is news. Diagnosis of a negative outcome goes up an alarming rate. Then it goes down and levels out and seems that things are going in a favorable direction. Then the negative numbers go up again. What are you and I to do, ladies and gentlemen? I think I know. We need to pray for strength like Jesus. So as we see that we need to pray like Jesus when trouble is near, when circumstances get to the best of us, we need to pray for strength like Jesus. Point number one is I dare you to pray for strength when trouble is near. But point number two, watch it. I dare you to pray when trouble is a non-negotiable. I dare you to pray when trouble is non-negotiable. Watch verse 41 right here in the text. 
Jesus walked on a little way before he knelt down and prayed. Father, if you will, please don't make me suffer by drinking this cup, but do what you want and not what I want. In these two verses, we see Christ accommodated himself to his undertaking where he was now about to enter. Making his soul an offering for sin, he afflicted his own soul with grief so sin can be satisfied. Notice what I said. He afflicted his own soul so that he can satisfy sin. How is it? He was overcome with grief, but he's the only one who can satisfy the grief that he was overcome with. That's paradoxical. Christ apprehended the wrath of God to which man had become obnoxious to. That means we cause sin to oppress us. Mankind brought trouble upon himself, yet Christ loved his creation so much that he takes on the oppression of his creation. Christ allowed his soul to be weighed down when he wasn't the one doing wrong. <laughs> listen, listen, listen. I love individuals. I love meeting new people. I love talking to people. The nature of my job as a bus operator, I meet people. I see people all the time that, that are the same, same people every day. But then I meet a lot of new people. And the nature of my job is I talk to them. I make them laugh. I make them feel good. I love people. That's my point. And I love talking to people and meeting new people. But taking on the issues of people, that's another thing. Yeah. I, have, I have adapted a mantra. <laughs> and that is, wow, that's a personal problem. <laughs> Perhaps that's something I need to work on. But case in point, Christ is getting ready to take on the problems of individuals. Takes on the problems of humanity because he loves his creation. Love ushers in a new reality. Love causes us to have a new viewpoint. Love cross causes Christ to be beaten, spit on, kicked, punched in the face. Love causes Christ to go to the cross and die for us. That's love beyond measure, ladies and gentlemen. Even though this was his purpose for being born to die. Listen, Jesus' purpose in putting on flesh was to die. Jesus did not come to earth to get all of these houses and make all the money and get all the education and drive all the cars he can. Nothing wrong with that, but that's not what Jesus' purpose was. Jesus' purpose was to die. Ladies and gentlemen, that was non-negotiable for him. Jesus knew that before the world was even created, that he was going to die, and it was hard in his, in his human state to look forward to that. We know there are areas in our, our life that we have to venture into. We must go here, we must go there, we must do this and we must do that. It's unavoidable, it's non-negotiable. What are we to do in those non-negotiable circumstances? This is what we must do. Dare us to pray for strength like Jesus. Notice what our Lord does. He goes in private right here in the text and does what? Prays. After all, we already said it, that prayer is the exchange of ideas. Get away from the noise. Go in private and share with the Lord. You know about those private moments, especially if you have little children like I do, and they get real noisy, and they get real rambunctious. You find ways to go to the bathroom even when you ain't got to go to the bathroom. <laughs> Just to get that five minutes of peace. Say amen, somebody. Ain't nobody have, you don't have no little children? You ain't never had no little children? <laughs> you know how to get away in those private moments and pray. This is the idea. Get away from the noise and exchange your ideas with God. So watch this. God needs to infuse himself in every aspect of our lives. That's why we need to pray to him in non-negotiable situations. There is nothing that we do without God. Nothing, no thing that we do 
without God. It doesn't matter what it is, driving, shopping, testing, working, closing a business deal, choosing friends, choosing a mate, say amen somebody. Choosing a congregation to even be a part of. There is nothing that you and I do without God being infused in our life. But we need to pray like Jesus did. Though Christ had no conveniency to retire but a garden, yet he retired there to pray in private. This should particularly be our practice. After all, being at the table with the Lord and the table in terms of communing with him, remembering what he did for us. After all, that's the Lord's table. That's communing, remembering together with the body of Christ what Jesus did for us on the cross. 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 30. It's okay to be in private and pray to the Lord. What did Jesus do? Jesus exhorted his disciples to do this. Though the approaching trial on the next day was, watch it, unavoidable. Yet they might not enter into the temptation of sin as the problem comes on the next day. What is the temptation on the next day? The inclination to desert Christ. That's the sin right here in the context. Jesus says to them, pray that you be kept from sin. The inclination to desert Jesus Christ is the result of our thinking that we know what's best for us. Ruth Haley Barton in her book, Pursuing God's Will Together, makes this statement. We often pray for wisdom while we already are attached to some outcome you and I think is best for us. That will always result in the inclination to withdraw from God. We have a great example in Jesus, how he withdrew from the inclination to sin and went and prayed. What an example we get when we get that feeling that we know best, it's time to pray. So I dare you to pray like Jesus. Jesus prayed that it be the will of God that this cup of suffering be passed from him. This, this, this bitter cup must be removed from him. And that's okay because that was the language of innocent dread of the suffering that was going to come. Jesus, being really and truly man, he could not take on or didn't want to take on that nature of pain. But watch the understanding from the text you and I are trying to receive. Because Jesus is God, when the dread of death comes over him, he resists not to go that direction. Once again, dread of any sort doesn't give the Christian any excuse to digress from God. In any form, the God side of him shines forth and overshadows the dread that's going to come. So should this be with you and I. In agony and dread, do not avoid God. So Jesus prayed for strength. So I'm daring you this morning. I double dog dare you to pray for strength like Jesus. Jesus, knowing it's the, it's the Father's will that he should suffer and die, that was settled. That was a non-negotiable. Watch it. It was necessary for him to die for our salvation. Jesus did not resist that. Actually, he resigned himself <laughs> to the Father's will. It's right there in verse 42. Watch what he says. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Not the will of his human nature, but the will of the God nature. Human nature wants to avoid issues at any cost. God will give us strength to bear up the trouble for our betterment. But watch this. We must go to him in prayer. Notice what Jesus says, it's, it's your will and not my will. This, these two words, your will 
comes from an original Greek word, thelema. Thelema means that which is purpose. And we get the idea of that which is purpose from Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5, where Jesus brings us to him as sons. That was purpose from the beginning. So as we come to a conclusion, Jesus asks us to follow him in prayer. He's asking us to follow, uh, follow him in resisting temptation to leave God. He's asking us to be purposeful, just like he was in prayer. Jesus is asking his followers to follow him. Ladies and gentlemen, we must be purposeful in prayer. So watch it. This week, as you and I are praying, I want to challenge you that you breathe in while you're praying, thy kingdom come. And at the end of the prayer, breathe out, thy will be done. Brothers and sisters, I dare you to pray for strength like Jesus. Point number one, I dare you to pray when trouble is near, but I also dare you to pray when trouble is a non-negotiable. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, you give life, you give love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. It's your breath that is in our lungs. So guess what we're going to do? Not only today and every Sunday, but every day of our life. We're going to pour out a praise to you because you are the only holy Lord. And we're going to pour out praise every day to you in prayer. So in the strong name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.